Thank you very much, Jacques, for the kind introduction, and welcome to this next se session here on the atomic gyroscopes. So here we would like to use hot atoms to measure the rotation of objects with really high precision. So my name is Janine riedrich Möller. I'm working for the corporate research department at the Robert Bosch GmbH. I will give the first talk and the second talk is given by Mark Kulati from VTT in Finland. So let's start with a, uh, start with the first talk on atomic gyroscope for precise positioning. You probably heard of the Robert Bosch GmbH as a company and innovation for Robert Bosch is very important. Therefore, we decided to build a research campus in the northwest of Stuttgart in Renningen where we do research for Bosch. Here, approximately 1,400 associates are working in 400 laboratories and we are doing research in various uh, different fields ranging from robotics, artificial intelligence, automotive driving, healthcare solutions to sensor systems or even to quantum sensors. And now I would like to come the, to our quantum sensor that we are looking here into it. It is the atomic gyroscope. So for future mobility solutions, high performance inertial sensors such as accelerometers or gyroscopes uh, are really important and they have a large range of applications. That ranges from the automotive industry to avionics like airplanes, flight taxis, drones, or even to um, robots on a space mission. And the, they all require precise positioning and the performance of a gyroscope to measure the rotation rate, this is typically given by two parameters in literature, which are the bias instability that determines the drift of your system and the angle random walk, which basically depends the noise performance of your sensor. Well, actually these numbers, they don't say very much, so let's compare them to um, uh, sensors that are already on the market. This you can see in the uh, lower right uh, graph here on the x-axis is, x is plotted the bias instability. The lower this number, the better is the performance of the sensor. And on the y-axis, we have the uh, price per measurement uh, axis here. Yeah? And we see here in pink, these are the atomic gyroscopes, sometimes also referred as nuclear magnetic resonance gyroscope because we are using a nuclear magnetic resonance in an atomic gas here. And here we see a comparison, for example, to MEMS gyroscopes. MEMS gyroscopes, these are vibrating silicon structures uh, fabricated in a silicon, on a silicon wafer. This can be produced at a high quantity in low cost. You probably have a MEMS gyroscope in your smartphone, you have it in your car, and probably it's also a MEMS gyroscope that comes, or maybe it's a MEMS gyroscope that comes from Bosch. The bias instability here is in the range of one degree per hour. Now let's compare this to the other type of gyroscopes with our optical gyroscopes. We have here the laser gyroscopes or fiber optical gyroscopes. They basically use two light fields that are propagating in opposite direction and when a rotation is applied you exhibit a phase shift between these light fields and this it gives you the rotation rate. And these are typically used in airplanes. They are bulky, they are very cost expensive and so these are on the other side of the scale here where you have a bias instability in tens of milli-degrees per hour. And we expect the atomic gyroscope to be somewhere in between these extremes here. Yeah? So um, they, they, um, that the performance uh, is better than MEMS gyroscopes, like a factor of 50 better, something like this. And especially when you combine quantum technologies with MEMS technology, we see a potential for miniaturization. And therefore, we think it's interesting to look into this topic and to do our own research in this field here. Now, how does it now work? So actually, we use a nuclear spin of a xenon atom. And the nuclear spin, this is basically a magnetic moment. Um, when you place this in a static magnetic field, then a torque acts on this a small magnet on this magnetic moment, and the system, this magnetic moment, starts to precess. And this precession frequency, it's very characteristic. It actually depends on the magnetic field that you apply here, and the proportionality factor is the gyroscope 
biomagnetic ratio, which is actually a natural constant and depends on the atomic species that you're using. So this is a number that is well known. So the black formula here is now for system at rest. Now when the system rotates, then the external rotation rate adds to the intrinsic gamma frequency. So by measuring this omega L here, and by knowing and controlling very well the static magnetic field, you can deduce the external rotation rate. So this is the basic idea of this atomic gyroscope concept. Well, in our sensor, it looks um, a little bit more complicated or here a little bit more into detail. So we use the nuclear spin of xenon atoms to detect the rotation rate of our object. However, as a noble gas, this cannot be easily addressed via laser fields, initialized or read out, and therefore we are using rubidium as an auxiliary gas to initialize the system and read out the system via lasers. So the initialization is done uh, via the circular polarized pump laser here from the below that first orients the rubidium spins along the static magnetic field here. And then via spin exchange collisions, this orientation of the rubidium uh, spins is transferred to the xenon nuclear spins. And what they are now doing, they all process very randomly out of phase. This is not actually what you want. You really want to have an in-phase precession well coherently, and this is done by shining here from the side this AC magnetic field to drive all these nuclear spins, xenon spins, and in this case now the, all these small uh, magnetic moments add up to a macroscopic magnetization here of all xenon spins, and this is now precessing around the static magnetic field and is sensitive to a rotation rate. Now, to read out this system, again, we learned um, that rubidium is a very sensitive in situ magnetometer. Rubidium now sends the superposition of static magnetic field and xenon magnetization. And what the rubidium actually does, it is somehow doing a nutation around this precession of the xenon nuclear spins. And this we read out, this nutation of the rubidium via this linear polarized probe laser here, this polarization vector, this rotates accordingly to the nutation precession of the rubidium spins. So this is done here via this balanced detection scheme, and our signal, this is actually a combination of this fast rubidium oscillation and then modulated by a slow xenon precession. Now this is um, the, the xenon and the rubidium. These are confined in vapor cells. We have in investigated two types of, uh, of vapor cells. The first one are these MEMS vapor cells that has been fabricated as CSCM. And the second one are these glass blown vapor cells of different shapes that has been fabricated at the University of Neuchâtel. And both types of vapor cells, they have already been introduced in these very nice two talks at, uh, at the beginning here of the symposium. Then I would like to do some advertisement. We also investigated MEMS vapor cells that were packaged in a ceramic package here. And this packaging um, has been done by VTT uh, in Finland, and this will be discussed in more detail in the upcoming talk by Marco Lati. Okay, now, and this MEMS vapor cell is then placed here at the core of our, of our uh, sensor. We have here the pump laser, we have the probe laser, we have here the balance detection scheme, and the MEMS vapor cell, or the system here, this is then surrounded by a trial axial core system. We've seen we, we use some laser, uh, some magnetic fields to drive our system and to have the static magnetic field, and then all this is surrounded or sits inside of a magnetic shielding to avoid stray magnetic fields at the core of our sensor. And then we use electronics, basically lock-in amplifiers, to um, separate the rubidium signal from the xenon signal and to do some signal processing and also some electronic feedback control. So this is what we've then done within the Maximal project. So we actually developed an optical tabletop experiment to, do the, to test the functional principle. This has been built out of commercial components, lasers, commercial magnetic shieldings. We also developed the electronics for the system. This is based on an FPGA here uh, to drive the coil system, the magnetic coil system, to do the signal processing and the electronic feedback control. 
and also to better understand our sensor and to, uh, do, uh, to allow for parameter investigation, we developed a system model based on MATLAB Simulink, which basically consists of two parts. The first one is a physical model that includes xenon, precession of the nuclear spins, the rubidium, the optical detection and readout, and the driving of the magnetic field. So this is for the physics, and around this physical model, then we build up the electronics. So the electronic parts allows us to design the filters to do the signal processing and the electronic feedback control. And this um, yeah, electronical design is then transferred to a VHDL code and implemented on this FPGA here, so this um, does the functionality here on the FPGA. Okay, so now I've talked a lot about the setup, but how actually does the signal now look like? So here we see, for example, the xenonuclear spin precession. So this at time zero here, the precession has been initialized, and now these xenon spins, they start to precess, but they are not driven. So the amplitude decays over time. The decay time here is between two and a half to six seconds for these MEMS vapor cells. And when you look at the Fourier transform, we see here two pronounced peaks, which are associated to two different xenon isotopes in our vapor cell, 131 and 129, and they have different gyromagnetic ratios that you can see here. So in this experiment, we have applied a magnetic field of one microtesla multiplied by this gyromagnetic ratio. This gives us exactly this measured frequency here in our experiment. So this is actually really the nuclear spin precession that we see. We can do more, of course, in uh, our real system than we want to drive uh, the xenon nuclear spin precession here by this AC magnetic field. And here, for example, in this experiment, we sweep the frequency of this driving field, and when we hit the resonance, we see here a nice peak in the absorption signal of, this, uh, of the xenon um, signal, and we see here in blue the dispersion signal. So basically, absorption dispersion signals, these are two outputs of our lock-in amplifier. And we also see here the phase signal um, of the system. So here in the experiment, we set uh, the phase to zero when the system is at resonance. And exactly this phase signal can now be used to sense a rotation rate of our system. We simulate the effect of, the, of our system um, by using a synthetic rotation rate. So up to now, the ex these experiments are tabletop experiments. They cannot easily be rotated, so we simulate the rotation rate by uh, slightly changing the magnetic field. So by, slightly in by introducing a slight change in the magnetic field multiplied by the gyromagnetic ratio, this gives us a synthetic rotation rate, I would call it. And so here on the upper part, you see this applied synthetic rotation rate, so this change in the magnetic field. We have here chosen an elect, um, a rectangular shaped uh, um, stimulus, so to say, starting at zero, switching to minus five nanotesla, and then switching back, and here in the other direction. And what we see here below is the phase reaction of our system to this um, synthetic rotation rate. And we see that the sensor signal or the phase signal well responds to this external stimulus here. So this is the first hint um, that this uh, functional principle of this atomic gyroscope work. However, in future, we do not really rely on synthetic rotations rates, but we really want to measure a real rotation rate, and therefore we have here this uh, demonstrator um, with a, um, on a breadboard here, an optical breadboard of 45 to 45 centimeters that can be placed here on a rotation stage that has been designed and fabricated in-house, and this system now should be capable to measure a real rotation rate. So we have here a miniature version of a magnetic shielding, four-layer, a triaxial coil system is here integrated inside, and the MEMS vapor cell sits then here at the core of this magnetic shielding. We also have here two lasers, the pump laser that excites or orients the spins here in this axial direction, and the probe laser that uh, reads out the spin precession here um, in the radial direction and is detected here by this balance detector. And, um, yeah, we will come after this intermediate um, step 
we will come then to a shoebox size demonstrator. This is our goal, where we have here compact laser system, the magnetic shielding, and with a vapor cell inside and the detectors. Um, this it can be placed in a commercial rotation table that we, or commercial rotation chamber that we have in house and uh, to, to measure rotation rates. Okay, and with this, I'm already at the end of my talk. I would like to thank you very much for, your, um, for having me here, for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Janine. From the question point of view, uh, do we have something on the chat? So, a question from Vilius. Uh, why do you need to interact with xenon gas rather than reading out the precession of rubidium atom spins directly? Also, how do you mitigate the error introduced by external magnetic fields? Okay, so the first question is uh, related to um, xenon, the nuclear spindles of xenon, they have a much longer coherence time compared to rubidium. And the coherence time, this actually determines the angular random walk of our system, so one parameter that determines the performance of our system. And therefore, we decided to go to these nuclear spins because of this longer coherence time. The second question is a question how we correct for um, changes, slight changes in the magnetic field. And for this, we use these two uh, xenon isotopes. Yeah? So basically, uh, you say that one xenon isotope is used to measure the rotation rate, and the other xenon isotope is used to correct for some inhomogeneities in the magnetic field. Thank you. Next question from Ilya. He's very active, Ilya. Uh, what about magnetic cross talks, especially when the shielding factor is maybe 10 to the 6? That's, uh, that's a good question. I cannot um, for now answer, answer this question in detail because we don't have currently any data uh, on this specific uh, question. Yeah. Question from Michael. Uh, are the vapor pressures for a gyroscope similar to the atomic clocks? Yeah. Uh, Christoph? Oh, sorry, because uh, I answer for, uh, for this question. So if you have looked at the atomic clock uh, talk, so there we used a vapor pressure, a buffer gas pressure of around uh, 30 to 50 millibar, while in the in gyro gyroscope cells, we rather had uh, values around 300, 400 millibars. So it's uh, about a factor of 10 higher. Okay, I think uh, we have time for one or two questions more. Uh, the next question is... What is the bandwidth expected for the gyro output? Uh, can this technology be autonomous or should it be uh, in a hybrid mode? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so the bandwidth, this is a good question. So the bandwidth actually depends on what uh, static magnetic field you are using in your system. So the higher, yeah, let's say it very simple, the higher the static magnetic field, the higher the bandwidth can be achieved. However, you cannot really ramp up the static magnetic field. So there is some, um, uh, let's say, trade-off between um, a signal, uh, st a strong signal and a bandwidth, and you, you need to find there an optimum uh, position, yeah. And the second part of the question was, can this technology be autonomous or should it be hybrid? Hybrid means in combination with a MEMS gyroscope, for example. I would yeah. understand it yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. So maybe that we have these uh, high-performance um, atomic gyroscope in one direction where you want to measure the rotation rate with really high precision and in the other two axes you can use a MEMS gyroscope, for example. Uh, I think we answered all the questions. There was another question regarding bandwidth, but you answered. Thanks a lot, Janine, for, for your talk. And we are switching to the, to the next speaker. That would be uh, Marco uh, Lati from VTT. Uh, telling you about uh, LTCC, which is low temperature co-fired ceramic. Um, yes, this is about the, about the ceramic packaging for, for photonics applications and um, focusing on the, on the LTC technology. And um, uh, this VTD uh, has been involved in this, uh, in this work package uh, for OPM and for gyroscopes. And of course, we have also previous experience about the uh, atomic clock. Uh, packaging with, with LTC. All right, so let's start with, with, with the challenges what we find in the optical packaging and integration. So there's many things you have to take into account when you are planning these uh, this things, optical coupling, 
and especially this thermal management is getting more and more important nowadays. Uh, then usually you want to uh, combine optical and electronics things, so all these are noises with different things and ARF. Millimeter waves have to be considered, the, how the miniaturization affects the different things and, and, and so on. Uh, electromagnetic infer interference and encapsulation has to be also considered carefully. And of course then eventually everything has to be, uh, has to be aimed to the cost efficient uh, assembly and manufacturing part. And then, not this, not this, it's not a surprise that the ceramic technology can feel, fulfill all these uh, uh, challenges. Also, there are some examples about the optical coupling and uh, different kind of circuit carriers for 3D integration, thermal management, and uh, encapsulation. So, then this technology, what we have been uh, um, adopted here is this uh, low temperature of co-fired ceramics and uh, VDT has been working with this technology for 25 years and uh, there's a quite good experience with, uh, by us for, for that technology. So we start the process from the left upper part so we will first make the blanks those photos uh, so we make, we make a suitable side of sheets and then we punch the wires what will be needed there. Then we fulfill or fill those wires by stencil printing. Then we screen print all the conductors what are, what are needed. Then we combine those layers, align them, stack them, and laminate them using the isostatic lamination process. And then finally we, we fire at the temperature which is about 850 to 900 degrees. And here on the right side you see this kind of quite typical 10 by 10 centimeter substrate, typically they they include different kind of designs for, for research applications. And then, of course, if you want to make a real, real product, then on the left side, you, you see those uh, similar designs, similar structures there um, combined on that the panel. And then the last thing is, is to separate those uh, circuits by dicing. So what are the benefits of LTC technology? Um, Actually, we are working quite much with, with the ARF and the microwave and millimeter wave applications. Uh, we have experience about until, uh, until about 100 gigahertz applications, and we are actually at the moment working even up to 200 gigahertz. So that, that is also something which you could think when you are thinking about this gigahertz and terahertz applications. Uh, different kind of integrated functions, so electronics and optics can be combined on the same, same panel, same substrate. And uh, then we, if we think about the packaging things, um, you can see those are some pictures on, on the, that the, this kind of 3D structures are quite easy to do with this technology. And you can make a different kind of channels. For example, here, for example, here we have a patch antennas, so we have our cavities below those. And um, then, of course, these cavities can be used for, for cooling purposes. Uh, then, the interfield of reliability. There is a, there's a quite good match between the calimarsenide and silicon substrates. And uh, quite often, we compare the LTC technology for PCP technology. So, one benefit here is that a little bit better thermal conductivity, about 10 times better than uh, typically with PCP materials. Cost, well, this is not the cheap technology itself, but uh, let's, we can call it as a cost efficient. So we can combine different things there on the, on the same panel, on the, on the same model. Uh, fast prototyping, so the, the, this kind of typical cycle from, from the beginning to the end is something like two to three weeks to get the substrate diced. Okay, here are some numbers about our, our capabilities. So the thickness and the number of the tape layers, what we have achieved, uh, used at the moment is uh, over 10, 20 tape layers and uh, thickness of four to seven millimeters. Uh, typically they are in the range of uh, maybe one millimeter or something, but it's possible to do quite thick substrates. Uh, conductor line widths, what we are, have printed are 40 to 550 micrometers. And then of course it's possible to use a thin film process there on the surface. So then we can get to 20 to 30 micrometers wide lines. Wire diameter is typically 100 to 200 micrometers. 
And then, especially when we go to this kind of uh, sub, uh, substrate integrated waveguards, then it's very essential to get those wires close to each other. So the typical pitch of wires is 2.5 times the wire diameter. In some cases, it could be a little bit, there, a little bit better. Uh, this alignment of the layers will be done manually, so of course there's a little tolerances there. So let's say that something like 10 to 15 micrometers from layer to layer is the typical value what we can achieve. And uh, then this shrinkage tolerance is an interesting topic because these materials shrink during the firing, something like 15 percent, depending on the material system. Well, the shrinkage is not a problem, but of course the problem is that how to handle that from patch to patch. So the typical tolerance here is a plus minus 0. 1 person in that range anyway. In the vertical direction, it's a little bit more plus minus 1 to 2 person. Uh, then I have just a few examples about uh, some, some technological parts which could be, could be interesting for, for photonics, uh, like this uh, thermal management is, is a one key thing. So is it possible to have this kind of uh, thermal bias under the ship? So in this way that you can reduce the, dissipate the heat from, from the component quite well. And uh, the typical thermal conductivity for this material is 2 to 4 watts per meter Kelvin. But then by using this kind of, uh, mm, the, on, the, on the upper right side, shown those uh, via field structures, then you can reduce that thermal resistance quite, quite well. And uh, now we have seen that the, is, uh, there are more and more uh, need for this, this thermal, thermal management or reduce the, uh, the, the or improve the, the heat dissipation. So we have used to make this kind of thermal or micro channels. Uh, you can pump the liquid uh, in, inside the substrate and uh, remove the heat in, in that way. And then the, in the field of sealing, there's a different kind of options what you can utilize. The LDC material itself is, is a very stable and, and uh, hermetic itself. But the problems will be that when there's a bias going through that sub substrate, so these are some tricks you have to take into account then. And basically you can make a different kind of um, ceilings there. Um, like, like on the right side, there's a, there's a ship into the cavity, and in the inside the cavity, and then you can make this uh, just a flat um, um, soldering of lead there. Different kind of uh, encapsulations on, on the left side can be also used. And, uh, and in the field of flip shipping, quite often actually we are not using this kind of underfills because they are usually quite lossy materials for our, our applications. Okay, then we have been talking quite much about this vacuum sealing and, uh, yes, and that, uh, of course there's some benefits for this heat dissipation, also this kind of pressure fluctuations. And before this maximal there were some, some experiments already done and uh, there were some challenges and uh, then we, we bought this uh, vacuum sealing equipment for VTTs and there was a quite much uh, delays in that whole thing. So we just got the machine in, the, in around September time last year. And we started to make a test with, with that equipment. And uh, we have achieved, uh, well, we have uh, developed that process anyway quite much. And um, the temperature, Maximum temperature there is this 500 degrees, and vacuum level should be better than that, uh, 10 to minus 4 millibars. And uh, yeah, the first test has been carried for, for, for the gyros, and, and the, uh, really the problem here, or the problem here is that there are those small windows. If you remember that Chinese presentation, there was on that uh, little window, and uh, we believe that that caused there. This is the weak link at the moment there. So now we, are, we will have our internal projects um, to develop this pro um, technology more. And so we have to take a step back and uh, start with a little bit the simpler structures to, do, to, to develop that process. Anyway, this is, this is something that we are uh, uh, continuing the development work. So that's clear. Okay, and then the last slide here, just a some examples what we have done in the field of photonics. So for example, we were involved in the EU pilot, pilot line project uh, picks up and uh, there we used uh, or developed LTSIM substrate for, for 
using in the poser, as in the poser between photonic IC and the PCP. And that was for, for datacom application. And then, there, then we have been working quite much in the past for this, uh, this kind of uh, space applications for high-speed electronics. And uh, so basically this LTC should be quite a good material because anyways it should be quite uh, robust for mechanical shock vibrations and uh, radiate and, uh, and so on. And then we had an EU project about some 10 years ago. There was a quite uh, nice uh, complicated structure what we developed at that time. Uh, this was for, for the miniature mid-IR gas analyzer uh, process. And uh, I think that was uh, pretty much, yeah. So, LTC, well, uh, that's something what I didn't mention is that, that it's the technology readiness level, of course, that can vary a lot, but, uh, but uh, we have a one project, a um, um, product what we are manufacturing for aerospace applications, so that's why we have used that TRL uh, of nine there. But, uh, of course, there's a lot of then things which have to be developed, like that, uh, Vacuum, vacuum sealing part. I think that's quite much. Thank you very much, Marco, um, for this presentation on LTCC. Are there questions uh, from the audience? For the time being, there is no question on the, the chat. Uh, are there questions here? I would have one. Um, is LTCC, let's say, uh, a technology which can stay as LTCC, or do you always need, or either the need to, to move then to HTCC for a final product? Or can it be a product that is based uh, on LTCC? Well, at least that one product what we are manufacturing is for very harsh environmental application. It's a LTC substrate there, and uh, including some connectors and that. It's so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that LTC itself can work as such. Thank you. Are there other questions? So this is not the case. So thank you very much, Marco.